Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, it's been a while since we've looked at Peppermint, and they just released another version uh, about a month ago, and this is based on Debian Trixie, of course. And I wanted to ha have a brief look at it. And, of course, Peppermint is a distribution that has shifted a lot over the years. And a lot of that was because of the um, unexpected passing away of the original developer who had the original design of Peppermint OS as kind of being like a, a Linux Chromebook version, something that would run mostly internet-based and it would run on really low-spec hardware. And as he passed away and the community maintained the project, it did flounder for a while. And I think the last video I did was a little bit more critical of it because there were a lot of, like, they were trying to do everything. They were trying, they couldn't, didn't have much of a direction. And right now, I think they have a better direction. Now, it is not a direction that means Peppermint is for a, a new Linux user. So if you are new to Linux, I would steer you away from Peppermint. Go with Linux Mint, uh, Zorin, MX Linux. Those are distributions that have a lot more for the new users. Peppermint OS and this new iteration is really designed as a purely minimal system that works with very low system specs that you can effectively build out what you want. In fact, it's so build out what you want, Bluetooth apparently is not even installed by default. Um, and I'm not sure now it's possible that it's not installed by default because my installation computer did not have Bluetooth, although the one we're running this uh, quick look on here does have Bluetooth. And I was like, does this computer even have Bluetooth? I don't even know. I actually booted and I left Peppermint and booted back in Linux Mint to verify. Yes, indeed. Uh, so I will have to walk through the steps here on Debian's guide on setting up Bluetooth in order to do that. And mostly we're just going to work with Blue Man. I'm not going to do that in this particular video. Uh, but I do want to show you what it has to offer and uh, some of the, the little quirks with it. And I will explain why it is a good system, but it's not a good system for a brand new person to Linux. There's going to be a lot of things in here that don't seem as polished. There's going to be a lot of things in here that some people won't understand or may not want to uh, work with. So uh, out of the core, we have this welcome screen, which we can disable at start. There is uh, information. I think these will all probably just boot up web pages, and uh, it's going to show you uh, the various things in there, I, I hope. I don't know. I didn't actually click that button until now. Uh, also of note, I do have a, a fairly slow um, internet connection right now, so if things are slow on the internet line, that would be me. So here it's uh, it's using the SSB system, which basically produces a uh, a web app out of a website, and you can see that um, it's just taking us right to the about page on Peppermint. So a uh, community distro for all the ages and abilities, um, minimalist desktop, giving you the choice of what you want to install beyond a few basic tools. So on that basis, um, they say it's good. They say it's bare boned, no firewall, browser, officer, media player. Well, it does actually have a browser. It has LibreWolf is the default browser. Uh, that actually led me to one of my first quirks. If you go down here and search for web browser, you see the very first item is web browser and it just kind of pulls up this terminal. It's like failed to execute. <laughs> uh, presumably because a, there's no default web browser selected in the system. Presumably that's what that is. But I can't find that anywhere. If you just go straight to internet, you see you have uh, LibreWolf as your browser. Um, the other thing, though, about their SSB system, you see it's very clunky, very um, getting that toolbar up there is actually difficult. And keeping it up there to close it is also difficult. So there's a little bit of uh, quirks there with it. Now, I really like their suggested here. This really only has a couple of things here, but you can choose which web browser you want. So here's that. I might need to enter the pseudo password here. So let's go ahead and do that. And let's see, if you want the Tor browser, you can easily do it there. Of course, it's going to ask me for my pseudo password every single time. And I don't, which is weird because it's like, I don't see Firefox in here. As controversial as it is, Firefox should be in this list. It is a very, very, very open source browser that allows you to do pretty much everything with it. It's a weird decision that it's not here. Okay. Because like GNOME, the Epiphany browser... Who uses that? Like, really, a conqueror? Um, 
Chromium browser is the only other one I generally put on all of my systems to have a Chromium-based browser that's not regularly used. We also have uh, things over here, so KeePass. I do like uh, KeePass XC. I use that on all my different things. Here's a Snap Package Platform, Flatpak Package Platform, GNOME Software Store. Now, that leads me to there is no Software Manager on here. The only thing we have is Synaptic Package Manager. So if you are um, used to it, oh, well, actually, I, I can't get it out because right now it's still installing stuff. So that's why that error showed up. That was my fault. <laughs> I got to wait for this to finish before it's going to load that up. So if you do want a Software Store in the GUI, you might want to install the GNOME software store. I'm not sure if you set up the Flatpak package platform, if that will automatically set it up with the GNOME software store. So you might have to have a little bit of manual overriding there. Maybe we'll have a look at that. Let's see. It's still installing the key pass there. All right. So that's done. Uh, documentation, of course, these are all going to go over. We're going to go ahead and disable the auto start. I will not need that again. They have an update manager over here. Uh, all this does is goes in and launches, again, just a, another terminal that just runs a sudo apt update. Um, and I don't know if this runs this with the, uh, with the yes configured. So is it going to ask me questions or is it just going to do stuff? I don't know the answer to that. So uh, that is definitely one of the things to keep in mind with it. So as far as running updates, yeah, this works. Um, and uh, it, it, it does what it's supposed to do, but it does it via the terminal. Again, the, uh, the other software tool. Let's go ahead and pull up the... Um, uh, let's see if I can find that suggested applications again real quick. I want to see what happens if I add Flatpak and the GNOME software store, if that integrates those or if that's something I have to manually do. So let's go ahead and do that. And then I'll come back to the video when these are done installing. Okay, so the updates are done. That is done. So now let's check the GNOME software store. Is it there? I have no idea. And GNOME Software Store is still not apparently showing up. Uh, let's go ahead and have a look at, I don't know, maybe it's something I need to log out for, which we're not going to do. And let's try it in Terminal. Uh, I think it's called GNOME Software, I think is the name of it. So there you go. So GNOME Software Store boots up. And my question is, is does installing the Flatpak system and installing the uh, GNOME software store, does that integrate the two or is that still something I'm going to have to manually configure? So first we'll check our software repositories. So here we have the Brave browser, Debian Trixie stuff. Everything looks there. I'm not seeing any references to your Flatpak. So let's look at Audacity. Um... Uh, and it's only pulling it from our uh, from our repo. So no, the GNOME software store does not automatically integrate with the um, with Flatpak. So if you wanted to use Flatpak with the GNOME software store, you're going to have to go through the documentation and add that in. All right. So having a look at this, it, it is uh, honestly giving us everything that we need there. So. Um, just your basic tools are available, but it doesn't give us anything else. As far as the education, this is, I was just experimenting with the, um, with the SSB system. And I'll show you where that is in just a moment. That's going to boot up YouTube. And it just goes right to my channel. So now I have a simple application, which is in the menu that goes right to my YouTube channel. Again, though, it's like it's really clunky if I want to shut the thing down. So uh, there's that. Those are managed over here in uh, Kumo. So this is where you just give it a name, appoint the menu location, enter the URL, and then you use the icon button down here. Uh, to add the icon, and then you can manage them like this. So I can run this, I can remove this. So if I, well, I think I've removed it. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, it looks like it did remove. So removing it apparently closes the whole application down as well. And again, that's kind of unexpected behavior. There's the Tor browser I installed. Uh, I added Simple Screen Recorder just to record the video. Here's your system information. 
So again, it just launches up a terminal and calls that. So there's basically a lot of little bash scripts in here rather than installing external applications. Uh, we could have got, gotten this with like fast fetch. I don't know if they have fast fetch installed or not. Nope. So uh, that might be a fun one to do. Sudo apt install fast fetch. All right, let's clear that out and run a fast fetch. There you go. So there's, uh, I would have preferred they did this instead of the, what they're doing, but uh, that's a little bit better. Uh, we do have, as far as system monitors, we do have our, uh, just the basic task manager. They also give us uh, a B top plus, so we can see what that looks like over here. And uh, one of the reasons that this system is really good is it's so minimal that it runs on such small amount of system memory. So right now we're using two gigs of RAM. That's actually a lot. I'm not sure. Oh, probably because we're doing screen recording. Duh. That's probably it. And this is still running in the background as well. So get rid of the screen recording, getting rid of that. Uh, in our tests, this runs at about, I'd say this runs at about uh, 500 megabytes at most when you're using it. And let's see, under settings, of course, we have our basic settings panel over here. So you can pull that right up from the menu and you can do all of your basic settings. Now, one of the things down here that I wasn't a huge fan of is some of these, again, a lot of these things in here just pull up scripts and it's not always clear what they're doing. Like this, I know is a carryover from the original. This is a blocker that's gonna add a bunch of, uh, a bunch of blocking stuff into your host file but it's not really clear what it's doing. And you can see that even from the tooltip, it says it's a GUI for the daily update tool. And this is not a GUI, this is a terminal. And it looks like what it's doing is it's going to be making adjustments to your host file, but I'm not totally sure. And so when it gets down to ask me for the password, I'm not sure what it's doing. So I'm not entering my pseudo password there. Uh, let's see, the, there, there's the X daily. So this is the automated system maintenance. All right, so this is where you can automate individual tasks. So you can uh, automatically set it up for checking for updates, viewing updates, running it, cleaning uh, the apt cache, things like that. Uh, here's system maintenance, removing your thumbnail cache, re re uh, recently used. Uh, what's this one? Sometimes the updates are applied in upstream branding may override our custom branding. So if you want to reset the peppermint branding, here's SSD trimming. Uh, it shows the operating system uh, sends the trim command to SSDs. Uh, that's actually would be a good thing to run since I'm running this on an SSD and I just got my password wrong, I think. Yeah, maybe it didn't. Yep, there it is. It, it, I did indeed. There you go. So managing your um, your various uh, tasks, this is actually a nice tool to have and not uh, not the most elegant looking thing, but it doesn't really need to be depending on what you want. Again, the, the overall focus of Peppermint is not in having a, a good user-friendly polish like I usually talk about on my channel. It's to have something that's minimal, that works, that you can customize to your liking. And I would say that uh, despite the, the small quirks, they've actually accomplished exactly that. This is a very good system. It's very low weight. It doesn't have any extra stuff on it that you don't need. And it just gives you the ability to add the various tools that you want to add and um, make things work. So let's go ahead and have a look at, uh, <clears throat> let's add Chromium to that. I'm gonna test that out and see if that fixes my web browser thing. Yay, there it goes. <laughs> now our web browser is fixed. All right. Uh, so no default. That's why that error had showed up at the beginning that I had noticed. All right. So they did actually accomplish something that's very good. And it's a Debian based kind of think of it like a Debian based, like uh, Archie type thing. That's a lot more lightweight. Uh, you basically install it as a core and then you add to it all of the different things you need to add to it to make this thing do what you want to do. And that really is the purpose of Peppermint. And it's if assuming that is our goal and that's what they're telling us, then I actually think they have completely accomplished their goal. They've given us a really nice lightweight system without the bloat, 
allowing us to build into our system exactly what we want. And for that, I think Peppermint is very good. And if you are looking to jump off of your basic Linux systems onto something else where you have to get your fingers wet a little bit and just figuring out some things, this might actually be a really good system to try. So I'd encourage you to have a look at that. Uh, but uh, again, if you are just now looking to switch to Linux, this is not the distribution for you. You really want to spend some time focusing on a distribution that uh, that has a lot of the GUI polish. Linux Mint, Zorin, MX Linux are good choices for that. Maybe a Fedora if you want something down a uh, you know, completely different route out of the Debian branch. Um, Cache OS, people have been having a lot of success with. I'm not sure if it's as much as the brand new user, but a lot of people are using that. So uh, they have accomplished a lot of really good things here, and I would highly encourage you to have a look at it as long as this is not your very first Fourier into Linux. Thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below.